Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Senate, Senate President, honor, honorable members of the House and the Senate, uh, members of the Executive Council, and of course, members of our Supreme Court, uh, and all the, uh, our citizens joining us today. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, today, we're here to address uh, our time and honored tradition of the state of the state to kind of bring you up to date in terms of where we are and more importantly where we can go. You've heard me say before that New Hampshire does things a little differently. We challenge ourselves to find innovative solutions. We don't subscribe to a one-size-fits-all approach and that has allowed the state to be stronger and better than ever before. When New Hampshire's people do it New Hampshire's way, we set the course. We provide a great model for the entire nation. We don't get bogged down in the dysfunction that we see down in Washington. We work together whenever possible to make sure the state is truly the best it can possibly be. And in this past week, the Granite State took the responsibility once more as the eyes of the world were truly upon us. In a year with high stakes, we saw record turnout in our first in the nation primary. And it isn't the governor or the legislature or political parties that de dealt that successful primary, but our city and town officials, our moderators, the clerks, the supervisors of the checklist, and the hundreds of Granite Staters that volunteer their time to help out on prim primary day. And most importantly, and especially, uh, Secretary of State Bill Gardner, <laughs> Dave Scanlon. We say thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Great job, great job by the entire team. Now we know New Hampshire is not one to follow the whims of other states. Other states follow us. We take great pride in that. When times are good, we don't raise taxes. We don't create bureaucracy. We create opportunity, doors of opportunity that solve problems, innovate, and simply get the job done. In just the last year, we've stopped unnecessary new taxes. We've eliminated the Merrimack tolls once and for all. I see our Merrimack friends here. Dick Hinch, great job. We took historic action to protect our environment. We prevented business tax increase. We made record investments into our education system, child protection programs, and mental health. We fully funded the developmental disability wait list. We ended the order of selection in our vocational rehab program. We lowered health insurance costs, and we ensured health insurance protections for those with pre-existing conditions. And that was just the beginning, just the beginning. 2019 was a banner year for the New Hampshire economy, and over the last year, New Hampshire families have benefited greatly from our record levels of unemployment growth, our focus on our workforce while making high-paying, quality jobs available, and we see that it pays enormous dividends. Business taxes are at the lowest this century, and more people are working than ever before. The model works, and it is proven. In just the last year, study after study across this country, New Hampshire has been recognized on a national level for an unparalleled quality of life. We're no the number one state in the country for economic freedom. We are the number one state for the lowest, lowest poverty rate in the country. We are the number one state for the taxpayer return on investment and the number one state for opportunity. We have to keep increasing and building on that opportunity for everyone, build a career path for everyone at every stage of life. My administration has taken the task of ensuring we're leaders in developing what we call a, a true 21st century workforce. As part of a strong economy, we must ensure that everyone is treated with fairness and respect. And as part of that effort, I've asked Senator Jeb Bradley to sponsor the New Hampshire Pregnant Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which will ensure that pregnant women are treated fairly on the job and are provided with reasonable workplace accommodations. No woman should be forced out of a job or denied employment or opportunities simply because she's pregnant. Good 
Alicia. At the same time, we're trying to provide more flexibility in our workforce. That's why the state has now established the Infants in the Workplace Initiative, one of the first in the country, which will allow our state employees to bring their infants to work in the early stages of life, which will keep our state competitive and provide immense benefits to the family. And as we've discussed many, time, another, many times, another huge opportunity we have is with paid family leave. Senator, Jab, J, Senator Jeb Bradley's bill, which I wholeheartedly support, has been vetted by insurance officials, and it's the only shot of delivering a viable, voluntary, paid family leave program that doesn't contain an income tax. Let's not miss this opportunity and get it done for the citizens of our state. Just last year, while states like Connecticut, Vermont, Massachusetts, they were all seeing decreases in their population. New Hampshire saw an increase. And these workforce initiatives are more critical than ever before. We're now ranked as the most popular destination in the Northeast for millennials. And if we want to keep up that momentum, it's these game-changing initiatives that will truly be critical. Our record of success is no accident. It happened as a result of a very deliberate pro-jobs, pro-growth agenda. From your prices at the gas pump to taxes, energy rates, I fought hard against raising costs on our citizens. It wasn't always easy, but it was the right thing to do. And I strongly urge you, my friends in this legislature, across this entire legislature, to continue down me with this path. As I think most folks in this know, a lot of the 2019 legislative session it was consumed with the, with the budget with the budget battle, the budget negotiations, you can call it. But both sides came together, worked over the summer, day after day in good faith. Members of both parties came together, worked out a compromise that everyone could truly be proud of. The budget was a big win for New Hampshire families because we held the line on taxes, we returned cash to cities and towns for property tax relief, and we provided historic event investments into our education system. The budget didn't make financial promises that could not be kept, and that's something that the people in New Hampshire should be very, very proud of. <laughs> Budgets serve as that roadmap to the future, which is why we made historic investments into our education system. In 2019, even before we had gotten the budget done, New Hampshire invested more dollars per child in public education than at any time in its history. And with our strong economy, our new budget does even more. We've sent $62 million back to local school districts simply for school infrastructure projects. We've restored stabilization grants to school districts across the state. We've increased funding for full-day kindergarten. We, full fu we fully funded the special education aid. We froze tuition at the university system and in our community colleges. We doubled our nursing programs at UNH, and we finally restarted the long absent LPN nursing program within the community college system. Now, despite these amazing education investments, an individual's education path doesn't always fit into the traditional four walls of the classroom. So we've had to be bold and allow our system to be flexible around the needs of the student. Last year, we announced the creation of the New Hampshire Career Academy, an innovative program that allows students in New Hampshire schools to, re to receive a high school diploma, an associate's degree, and a guaranteed job interview, all at no cost to the student and no cost to the taxpayer. Just last week, we officially opened enrollment into that program at our community colleges. Students can start signing up now. This initiative, it's a win for students and families, and especially the businesses that power our economy, making that connection right from the student, through the school system, right to the workforce initiatives that we're creating today. We also continue to push our limits on early childhood education. 
I think a lot of folks know how passionate we are in the corner office on early childhood education and development. And if you want to build the best workforce, I think we all know it starts providing the best education at the earliest stages of life. My approach since day one is to, be, to increase family engagement at every setting. Last year, I proposed $6 million, one-time cash infusion into UNH to rebuild the Early Childhood Center of Excellence, to serve as a model, not just for New Hampshire, but for the rest of the country to ensure that New Hampshire never again falls behind the curve for our kids. Unfortunately, the investment was removed by, from the budget by the legislature, but undeterred, the state worked with UNH and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to secure a $26 million federal grant from the Department of Education, the biggest of its kind, which will build capacities for learning and well-being at home, in childcare, and community-based settings. And when it comes to education, we know we have to build at both ends of the spectrum. Last year, I budgeted for a $160 million, 10-year investment student debt relief program that would have cost the taxpayers nothing. Unfortunately, the legislature killed the proposal, but I am hopeful, very hopeful, that we can find a compromise and finally deliver opportunity to provide student debt relief and direct scholarships, again, at no cost to the taxpayer. The opportunity for graduates, along with our workforce housing legislation, which is before you now, can help ensure that we can retain the students and really build that workforce of tomorrow. I'm thankful to have bipartisan support for all of these efforts, and I truly am confident we can get the job done. There are many things that the people in New Hampshire take pride in. We know that. We're very prideful here in New Hampshire. It's the Granite State, our high quality of life, our low cost of living, and our live free or die spirit. But another area in which we all have a stake in, and I think we all have a deep appreciation for, is our environment. Here in New Hampshire, we take the obligation of environmental stewardship extremely seriously. That stewardship doesn't just take the form of just spending on yesterday's ideas. We have the responsibility to be smarter, to be more innovative in our approach, weighing the impacts large and small, and not just committing to what's politically convenient. My administration began an aggressive approach with environmental responsibility, first by taking the, on the issue of clean drinking water, ensuring that our problem did not become a statewide crisis. And with the leadership of Senator Chuck Morse, the Clean Drinking Water Fund was established. And to date, the state has awarded over $100 million in projects to cities and towns across the state. We didn't stop there. We then set out the task of giving our best and brightest in the state to create more accurate science-based drinking water standards, the best in the country. Standards based on the best available, available data and sta standards that are now allowing Attorney General Gordon McDonald and his entire team within the Attorney General's office to lead the nation in holding these polluting account uh, companies accountable. They're fighting for New Hampshire, New Hampshire families, and we are going to win this battle. Then you add in all the, what we call the common sense environmental measures that we've taken. Banning oil drilling off our pristine seacoast, we got it done. Using the strongest offshore winds in the country for clean, ener clean renewable energy, we are moving forward. Dozens of new electric charging stations around the, around the state, they're coming online. And when other states try to shake down our residents for hundreds of millions of dollars in a gas tax that they call TCI, essentially a scheme to pay off failing and crumbling public transportation infrastructure in other states, we were the first state to stay up, stand up and say, absolutely not. Thank you. Now I'd like to take a moment and uh, take a little bit of a step back to talk about some of the core issues that we've been d discussing since day one. We've made great strides in, but we know there's always still so much to do with the issues of, uh, issues of addiction and drug use. 
It continues to afflict our, our communities. No one is untouched by the crisis. In 2017, we knew we had to take very bold and very innovative steps to truly make a difference. The federal government provided New Hampshire with the opportunity to take a whole new approach in fighting addiction when it awarded New Hampshire an unprecedented $55 million grant to create a new system. And one year after getting it up and running, the doorway is a success. Addiction treatment providers, the spokes in our hub and spoke delivery system, they agree the doorway is working. It's ensured that we truly have statewide distribution of Narcan and medication assisted treatment. And not just in the southern tier, but throughout New Hampshire. People are entering treatment, services are better coordinated, and lives are being saved. Those communities that have embraced and worked collabor collaboratively with the doorway have seen incredible results. The new system in the first year has already served over 7,000 individuals with the number of overdose deaths continue to fall. But the only way we truly solve this crisis is with prevention. I really believe that. I want to take a moment. I think he's here. I want to thank Patrick Tufts from Granite United Way. Patrick leads our Governor's Commission. Thank you, Patrick. They love you, brother. Who doesn't love Patrick Tufts? Patrick leads our Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs. And in this last year, they've taken unprecedented steps, not to invest a couple hundred thousand here and there, but literally millions of new dollars into prevention programs across the state. And again, we owe you a big thank you. Thank you to the entire commission. Thank you guys very much. Now, we all know that a critical issue that has been facing our citizens, especially our senior citizens, is the cost of prescription drugs. It's a hot topic and we can truly make a difference. We know we must lower our prescription drug prices and it starts with allowing the importation of drugs from Canada, greater transparency in pricing, and preventing the price gouging on our low-income families. And I really want to take a moment and thank everyone in the le legislature across both aisles who have been involved in these efforts helping move the bipartisan bills along. Please get them to my desk so we can get these initiatives truly moving forward and provide some relief to our citizens. I also believe that there is another big challenge the state faces. It's rarely discussed, but has great impact specifically with the care of our seniors. Specifically those who are waiting for placement in assisted living, assisted living facilities or nursing homes. It is a fact that New Hampshire has an older population, which has given us an advantage of constantly being ranked as having the mo most educated and experienced workforces in the country. But with that comes the challenge of long-term care services for those seniors. No one would deny that they deserve the highest quality of care and the least restrictive environment within a system that truly supports their needs. Unfortunately, too often their only choice is to live in a hospital bed for an extended period of time because there's no other options available while they await for appropriate long-term care. I always say that government's biggest responsibility is cre to create doors of opportunity for our citizens, all of our citizens. We can't wait for the current challenges surrounding senior health care to turn into a crisis. I believe government, local, county, state, all needs to be work hard to remove barriers to, to access and opening up those doors of opportunity. So today I'm announcing the formation of a working group led by our new commissioner, of Health and Human Services, Lori Chibonette. Is Lori back there? Hey! Thank you, Lori. <laughs> this working group has the charge to immediately begin to work with stakeholders, and within 90 days, Provide the idea, I gotta admit, she said she could do it in 60 and I'm excited, but we're gonna give her 90. Just, that's how good she is, that's how excited we are. But to work within 90 days to provide real ideas and solutions to get long-term care back on track in New Hampshire. So again, thank you, Commissioner Chivinette. We'll see you in three months. You know, when I took office, I called the state of mental health in New Hampshire our unspoken crisis. And we've taken mental health finally out of the shadows. We brought it to the forefront. And frankly, so many people, not just in this room, on both sides of the aisle, advocates, citizens, parents, kids, 
everyone deserves a lot of credit for coming to the table and designing not just a 10-year mental health plan that works for the people of New Hampshire, but putting everything they had behind it to move some very serious legislation forward. Rebuilding our mental health system has been a priority since day one. And I still believe in my true heart of hearts that we can become the best state in the country for community-based mental health services. We've made investments, and I am pleased to be here and talk about some of the data that is showing that our results are actually already paying off. We brought in a first-class team, and they're delivering results. It's taken a lot of hard work and cooperation to get to this point. But finally, we have a significantly declining wait list at New Hampshire Hospital. Since taking office, the average length of time an individual patient waits for admission has been nearly cut in half. In the last two years, the number of days patients are waiting in a hospital emergency departments has decreased by 60%. We've added dozens of new designated receiving facility beds across the state. We've ensured suicide prevention training in all of our schools. Mental health services for kids are being provided at appropriate facilities. And after 20 years of talking about it, we are finally moving forward with building the secure psych psychiatric unit to give those patients the dignity they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You know, another great area we're making huge strides in is suicide prevention for our veterans. It's on us to make sure that we stand firm for all those who stood tall defending our freedoms that we enjoy every single day. Today I'm proud to announce that the state of New Hampshire is partnering with the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs to combine and streamline all of our resources to put suicide prevention for our veterans at the forefront. It's a new effort that will allow us to share our best practices and truly join forces. As part of this effort, the First Order of Business is reaching out to every single New Hampshire veteran to let them know that every federal and state resource is it going to be available to them and to ensure them that there is no wrong door for getting mental health, service, mental health services. They are not alone. I had to check with the speaker. Truly, New Hampshire made drinking water. I love it. So as we come into this next year, I'd ask you all to be very reflective about what New Hampshire is all about. It's an interesting question. While the rest of the country is drowning in national negative political rhetoric, let's reflect on how we here in New Hampshire, we do a little bit different, and we do it a lot better. Let's remember what brings us together and brings out the best in each and every one of us. So there are a few people who have invited to join us today that I think really exemplify that strength. We all remember the horrific crash in Randolph back on June 21st, and it took the lives of seven motorcycle riders of the Jarheads, the motorcycle club known as the Jarheads. With us today, we have Manny Ribeiro and Don Brindley, survivors of that tragedy. Manny and Don, thank you guys so much for coming here today. Thank you guys. You know, following that horrific crash, there was a, um, a small group of individuals and they decided to do a memorial ride in honor of those victims. <clears throat> I'm going to get choked up. I'm going to get choked up. <clears throat> so I've asked the organizers of the Ride of the Fallen Seven to also join us today as well. So we have Brian D. Simone, Steve Allison, and Bob Wagner who are joining us. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Now their amazing story is this. So they had this idea for the ride, and they were talking about it, and they figured there'd be a couple hundred folks that might come up, ride up through New Hampshire to the site of that fatal crash. Maybe a few hundred folks would join them and really honor those victims and honor what it's all about. And the overwhelming level of support, it was just unbelievable. Within a few days, a couple hundred turned to a couple thousand, and it got pretty overwhelming. And some folks called, 
we were talking to folks at DOT, and they said, Governor, this is, this is getting big. This, I don't know how we're going to manage this. We want people to be safe. We've got to work town to town, all the law enforcement, the fire department. We don't know if we can do this. But we put our heads down, and we said we have to do it. And with their strength, day in and day out, as we, the, the ride leading up to there, we got it done. And I just want to thank the folks at DOT and the law enforcement, the firefighters. Everybody came together, because if you were there, you saw that ride. You saw the American flags, you saw people waving over the bypasses, and it kept going and going. Nearly 5,000 riders came into this state to honor those men and women. We cannot thank you guys enough. Look, it's that spirit that I want us to remember, that we have to remember. Let's remember why we do it, why we're here. The job is so much bigger than ourselves. It's bigger than politics. It is not about us, right? And if we can remember that spirit of coming together, we can remember that spirit of getting so much done together, I believe we all share that same pride in our great state. When we come together as a state, we do it better than anyone. And to be frank about it, I think Washington could learn a thing or two from the Granite State. We don't spend countless days locked in gridlock. We roll up our sleeves and we get it done. We have a lot more to do. We have a lot more to accomplishment. Let's put our heads down and get this thing done. Thank you guys very much. God bless you all. God bless this great state. Thank you guys. I appreciate it.